Mr Pope from Romans Grammar School for Boys and today we're going to be looking at some trigonometry basics. Um, now there's a whole host of things I want to look at with trigonometry and to be honest I wanted to keep the videos to around about an hour, hour and a half, two hours at most and I was thinking in my head if I did everything I wanted to do with trigonometry today it would probably take a lot longer than two hours. Um, you could probably say, well, maybe you should plan it and be more concise. But to be honest, um, you know what? I just like having a chat and having a good waffle. Um, if you've been in any of my lessons, you know that I like to go off on a tangent sometimes and talk about things. Um, so, yeah, um, trigonometry. So, um, trigonometry. Um, Okay, Greek word, uh, tree meaning three, gono meaning elbow or knee or like a joint, and metri just means measure. Okay, it literally means three elbow or angle measure. Um, so yeah, I can't remember if it's elbow or knee. Gono. It's it's one of the two. I can't remember. My my ancient Greek's not that good. Um, you can Google it. But yeah, trigonometry just means three um, angle measure, and it's to do really with triangles. Um, whenever we've got a shape uh, that has three sides and three angles, we're usually dealing with triangles. Um, now some people. Some people call it the circular trigonometric functions, uh, what we're going to be looking at today, because essentially they derive from a circle. And you're probably thinking, okay, what other types of trigonometric functions are there? Well, we're going to be looking later on at things called hyperbolic trigonometric functions, um, and they're based from parabolas. We'll be talking about that at some point. Um, I can't remember when we're going to, so we're going to go through that. Uh, hyperbolics, yeah, so stick around for the 15th of June. Yeah, one, two, three, four weeks away. Oh man, that's, that's a while away, but then think about it, this is week five. So you've done well if you, you're watching this so far. Anyway, right, so let's, let's talk about circles. So suppose I've drawn a circle. Well, actually, let's, let's go even further back from that. Let's say I've got the coordinate axis x, y. This is my Cartesian plane. And suppose I've drawn a circle looking like this. There we go. Lovely. And this circle is of radius 1. So that means it will cross the x-axis at 1, the y-axis at 1, the x-axis at minus 1, and the y-axis at minus 1 as well. Okay, this is often referred to as the unit circle. Uh, the reason why it's called unit is because its radius is one. So from the origin, you just spin, you take a radius like so, and you spin it around, and it traces out a circle like so. Okay, now let's suppose I've got a radius of one right here. And I've got a general point on the circle here, and we'll call that point x, comma, y. For an x value, it has a y value. Nothing groundbreaking yet. So, if I drop a perpendicular line to the x-axis like so, so I form a right-angled triangle, then the x-axis is the, the, the x-coordinate is the length of this orange line, and the y-coordinate at that point is the vertical height. Oh, that was bad. The vertical height. And you can probably tell from Pythagoras this is going to lead to x squared plus y squared equals to 1. And we've seen this already with the circle and equations for circles. Um, when did we see that? We saw that. Um, Whoa, the 21st of April, so a couple of weeks ago, 
in the geometry and vector section, we looked at equations of circles, all that kind of stuff. Now, how can trigonometry get involved? Well, let's say we'll have this angle here, which we'll call theta. Okay, and that theta value is the angle between the x-axis and the radius, and it's always going anti-clockwise from the x-axis. Now, there's no reason why. I mean, you could define it as going the other way around. It's totally fine. But, you know, for convention's sake, you know, mathematicians all around the world just agree that we should be going this way around. Um, there's no reason. I mean, if you wanted to find your own set of mathematics um, and work entirely that way, then you would have, you know, a system that would work and you'd be able to perform you know, all of the operations closed under algebra and all that stuff, and it should be totally fine, but generally speaking, we're talking about an anti-clockwise rotation around the x-axis, a bit like when we were doing um, complex numbers um, with certainty the very first time I was talking. Okay, so let's think about a few things. Well, well, from some of the stuff you should know in year 7, year 8, year 9, we have so ka toa Now, there's various ways of memorizing so toa To be honest, so toa I just know it. I don't have to think about it too much. Um, some people remember it. Some old horses can always hear their owners approaching. Uh, I don't care. Um, just memorize it. It's just not that big of a deal. Um, anyway, so so how does this work? It means that sine of theta equals the opposite. Well, the opposite is the y coordinate of this triangle over the hypotenuse of one. So that's just going to be the y coordinate, isn't it? Y divided by one. Is just y. Now, if I look at cosine of theta, then that's going to be the adjacent, which is the x coordinate, over the hypotenuse, which is 1. Or x divided by 1 is just 1. So, one of the main motivations of having a unit circle is because we're dividing by a hypotenuse of 1. So it makes things a lot easier. And then finally, can't forget tan. Tan, or the tangent of theta, is going to be the opposite, which is y, over the adjacent, which is x. OK, a couple of key points to take away from this. What do you see from all this? Well, I see that the y value of sine, or, or rather the, the y coordinates of any point on the circle is represented as sine theta. I have the x coordinates uh, anywhere on the circle is represented with cosine theta. And I've got tan of theta equaling to y over x. And in actual fact, what is y over x? Well, y over x is actually the gradient of the radius, isn't it? Because if you think about it, y divided by x is the change in height over the change going along uh, in the, the horizontal movement. And clearly, it's going to be y minus 0, because it's y coordinate minus the origin over x minus the origin, which is clearly y divided by x. So that's quite nice. So tan of theta is just the gradient of the radius, which is quite nice. OK, other things to point out from this. One, I've got tan is y over x. Do I know what y over x is? Yes. So actually, tan of theta is the same as sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. 
So there's our first little trig identity. And this is true for all values of theta. Tan of theta is the same as sine of theta over cosine of theta. So that's good. Because one of the things we're going to be looking at later on is rearranging trigonometric equations. And the hardest thing about this is you're going to have to be able to look at a trigonometric equation and go, right, I can sort this out, I can move this around and so on. And you can generally be really flexible with rearranging things. So, what next? Well, if I look back at this, x squared plus y squared equals 1, could I use trigonometric functions to represent that? Yes. Well, if x is cosine theta, then x squared is cosine squared of theta. And if y is sine theta, then y squared is sine squared of theta. And this equals to 1 for all values of theta. Okay, so a couple of things here. One, I should really be using a triple equal sign because that means it's true for all values. And this isn't an equation, this is an identity. Okay, notice how this x squared plus y squared is only true for this graph. In actual fact, the trigonometric functions always satisfy this. Uh, if you, you want to know why, well, let's suppose that this circle had a radius r, then sine of theta is y over r, cos of theta is x over r, y over r over x over r, the r's cancel. And then you're going to get r squared cos squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta equals r squared. You can divide everything by r to get a 1. And then clearly... Um, y over r divided by x over r is still y over x, so the top one is conserved as well. So it all works out in the end, it doesn't matter what the value of r is. However, depending on the radius of the circle, x squared plus y squared could equal some radius. So it's not entirely true that x squared plus y squared always equals to 1. However, the trigonometric identities will always equal to 1. Okay, right. Now, there's a couple of things I want to introduce you to. And that is, suppose I'm, I'm going to introduce what's called the reciprocal trig functions. And the reason why they're called reciprocal trig functions is because we take the reciprocal, 1 over sine of theta, 1 over cosine of theta, 1 over over tan of theta. Now what are all these things? Well, 1 over sine theta is called cosec of theta, or the cosecant. Okay, that's cosecant. Cosine is the secant, or sec theta. And tan 1 over tan becomes the cotangent or cot theta. Okay, These reciprocal trig functions are really useful as well. Now you probably remember when we were doing some differentiation and stuff, you probably saw stuff like um, tan differentiated to sec squared and stuff like that. Well, this is what cosec, sec and cot are. And the way I like to remember them is the third letter of each one tells you what it is. So the third letter of cosec is S, so it's 1 over sine. The third letter of sec is C, so that's 1 over cos. And the third letter of cot is T, so that's 1 over tan. You, c you know what? You can remember it however you want to. Um, I don't mind, just please remember it. You know, I don't mind how you remember numbers 1 to 10. I mean, I just assume you just remember it couple of billion times you use the numbers it's not actually that bad oh, just realized my microphone's a bit down hello can you hear is that a bit better hello 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 right okay so um okay so let's try and introduce some equations involving our reciprocal tricks so for example 
Say I've got my cosine squared theta plus my sine squared theta equals to 1. What would to happen if I was to divide everything by sine squared theta? Look what happens. Well, the first term, cos over a sine, is, is the same as tan, but flipped, isn't it? Because it's the other way around of sine over cos. So the first term is just going to be um, cot squared. Sine squared over sine squared is just 1, because it's the same top and bottom. And 1 over sine squared is cosec squared. So already, we've got cot squared plus 1 equals cosec squared. Lovely jubbly. By the way, a little important bit, I've said this before in other videos, but we put the squaring function uh, just before, oh, pardon me, just before the argument there. And the reason for that is because if you put cosine and then theta and then squared like that, then there's a bit of ambiguity of, well, are you squaring the theta or are you squaring the whole thing? What's going on? And generally speaking, um, Cosine squared of theta is the same as cosine theta all squared. And even more general, cosine cos to the power of n of theta is the same as cos of theta all to the power n. Ah, it's just the same way of writing it. Don't panic. Okay. So what other equations can we derive from this? Well, actually, the next easiest one is we divide it by sine squared. Well, we could actually divide by cosine squared, and the similar identity would be, well, cos squared divided by cos squared is going to be 1. Sine squared over cos squared becomes a tan squared, theta, and 1 over cosine squared is sec squared, theta. Now, this one is actually incredibly useful. Okay, so... For example, why, why is this one particularly useful? Well, suppose I want to integrate tan squared of x. Then from this equation here, I know that tan squared of x equals to sec squared of x minus 1. So integrating tan squared is the same as integrating sec squared x subtract 1. And this is quite easy to integrate because sec squared is what happens when you differentiate tan of x. And minus 1 integrates to minus x and then plus an arbitrary constant. So integrating tan squared isn't necessarily that easy. You could do integration by parts and get a little bit messy and all this other stuff, but I personally wouldn't do it. Or you could just make a substitution and let tan squared equal sec squared minus 1 because you know this little trig identity here and you can integrate sec squared quite easily. Okay. Similarly, if I was to integrate cot squared, uh, I think minus cosec squared integrates to something as well. It's in the formula booklet, I can't remember. The point is, being able to manipulate integrals uh, with trigonometric stuff is like really, really helpful. Um, and the better you are with these kind of things, you know, the quicker it's going to be. Now, so... You're probably thinking, okay, so, right, I've just learned all these equations. Uh, right, what the hell do I do with them? What's the point? Well, you might have to solve something like this. For example, uh, cosine of 2x equals to 1 half. And we want to find all the values for x, which is true, between 2 pi and 0 radians. Okay, this might be an example of what we need to solve. So find all the values of x, which cosine of 2x equals a half, and x has to be less than or equal to 2 pi, but strictly positive. Okay, so first of all, let's deal with some things. Um, let's get rid of these over r's, because they don't apply anymore. Okay. What can you tell me about sine of theta? Well, it's the y-coordinate, isn't it? Now, if I look at this graph of the circle, 
that has a y coordinate of 0, and then it reaches a maximum of 1, and then it reaches 0 again, and then it goes to minus 1, and then it goes back up to 0. At no point, so we actually have that sine of theta is trapped between 1 and minus 1. We have cosine theta is trapped similarly well, the x-axis, it goes from 1 to z minus 1 and then back to 1 again. It's either going, it's going to be trapped between 1 and minus 1 still. Tan of theta, a little bit trickier. Now, think about it. Tan is the gradient of the radius. So when we're at the origin, when theta is 0, or sorry, when we draw a line out like this when theta is 0, so we're on the x-axis, then the gradient is 0 because it's flat. And then there's a positive gradient, positive gradient, positive gradient. At 45 degrees, the gradient's 1. Then it's bigger, 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 and then it approaches to infinity. And then we have an undefined gradient which is vertical. And then as soon as I drop past it, it's now an incredibly negative gradient because it's sloping downwards technically. Then it's less negative, less negative, less negative, less negative, less negative, zero. And then it's positive, positive, really positive, really positive, really positive, positive, get into infinity, get into infinity, undefined. And then it's negative, 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 less negative, less negative, approaching zero, approaching zero, zero. So actually, our gradient could be anything. So it could be between positive and negative infinity. Now we don't include that because infinity is a concept it's not a number so we won't have we have a strict inequality going on there um, so if I want to solve these equations I have to be very wary whether sine theta cos theta or tan theta fall into these bounds so I have to ask myself can cosine of something equal to one half well cosine has to be between minus one and positive one and since half is in that range, then yes, it has a solution. For example, if somebody asks you to solve cosine of 2x equals to 2, because you know that cosine can only be between minus 1 and 1, you would say there's no real solutions. And the clue into what kind of numbers you'd have to use is there. Okay, There would be complex solutions. You'd have to involve imaginary numbers. And no doubt we will look at that another time. In actual fact, um, on the 8th of June, when we look at the complex plane, Dumoivre's theorem, loci, and some more interesting trigonometry. So I look forward to it then. But at the moment, I, I've tried to partition off the trigonometry all into four blocks. Well, five blocks, actually. The first block is solving simple problems, uh, reciprocal stuff, radians and applications. Um, then next time when we're talking about double angles, addition formulae, derivations, solving more advanced trig. The week after that, polar coordinates, because that you know that's heavily dependent on trig. And the week after that, complex plane stuff. And then we'll finally finish the trig stuff with hyperbolic functions. Uh, that's not to say trig doesn't go on beyond that. Uh, there's various other trig functions as well. Uh, if you're ever into um, aerospace stuff, aerospace engineering, aeronautical engineering, uh, you'll hear about things called steradians. Um, bit wacky, but if you want to get your head around that, it's totally fine. So, okay, let's suppose I want to solve cosine of 2x equals to a half still. Okay, right. Now, I'm going to draw each of these graphs in turn. So I'm going to consider what does the y equals sine of theta graph look like? Well, first thing to note, and this is really important, is that if I take a radius going from there to there when theta is 0, and I open it up to pi over 2, and then pi, because that's 180 degrees, then 3 quarters of a turn, and a whole turn, I'm now back to where I was. So what's happening is my graph should repeat itself every 360 degrees or every 2 pi radians. 
Can you see how this repeats itself every 360 degrees? Now, it may repeat itself more often than that, but 100% sine and cosine, the x and y values, are going to repeat itself. In actual fact, all the gradients here are going to be mirrors as if the gradients were over here. So I know that this stuff should be the same as this stuff, and this stuff should be the same as this stuff as I'm working around. But anyway, so let's think about it. Sine theta is the y-coordinate. So the y-coordinate starts at 0, it goes positive up to 1 at 90 degrees, and then is back to 0 at 180. So let's think about that. Let's get some key points. Okay, so there's 90 degrees, there's about 180, there's 270 degrees, and here's 360 degrees. Or, if we're going to be big boys and girls and use radians, this is pi over 2 radians, this is pi radians, this is 3 pi over 2 radians, and this is 2 pi radians. And for reasons we've said before, sine is trapped vertically between 1 and negative 1. And as we said before... It's going to be have a height of, well, let's think about it. The y coordinate is 0 at 0, then it goes to 9, then it goes to 1 at 90, then 0 again. So 0, 90, 0, and then 180 degrees to 270, it's at minus 1, then 360, it's back to 0 again, and then it just keeps repeating. And in actual fact, this is a smooth, continuous function because the y-coordinate is ever increasing and decreasing. It's constantly changing. So there's going to be no flat lines. It's not just a zigzag like this. It's not a constant rate. Because if it were, the y-coordinate would just kind of be going up and down like this. Or rather, the sketch would look like that. It's not. So what's going on? So we've actually got a smooth, continuous function looking like that. Not drawn particularly well, but something along those lines. This is the y equals sine of theta graph. And if I was to label my axes, this is y, and this axis is theta. Okay, so let's do the same thing, but this time... Natural fact, let's... Grab all of this and whack it down here, make it a bit smaller. Let's do cosine theta. Let's do it side by side. Whoops. Let's do it side by side. So what happens when we've got cosine theta? Okay, so I need to get rid of these things. Okay, so same deal. The x-coordinate is going to repeat itself every 360 degrees. So the x-coordinate starts at 1 when theta is 0, and then when we open it up to pi over 2, the x-coordinate is 0, and then here the x-coordinate is minus 1, then 0, then 1 again. So just to confirm... This is when theta equals to zero. This, at this point is when theta is pi over two radians. This point when theta equals three pi over two. Oh, geez, that's a lie. That's when theta equals to pi. Pi, this is theta equals to three pi over two. And theta is zero, two pi, and so on. So, as you can probably work out, actually, it starts at one starts at 1, goes to 0, then at minus 1, then back to 0, and then back to 1 again. Okay, and what's important to note is because these, these functions have a period of 2 pi. That means they repeat themselves every 2 pi radians, or every 360 degrees. So that means this cosine graph will carry on forever, like so, in both directions. 
and the sine graph will repeat itself in both directions forever and ever, like so. We're only interested in the slice of it between 0 and 360 degrees, because once we found that one little loop like that, we can just keep repeating and keep adding uh, multiples of 2 pi or 360. Right, now tan. Interesting. What's going to happen for tan? So, oh dear. Okay, so for tan of theta, what's going on? Well, for this one, oh dear, I want the gradient of the points. Um, but actually, I can probably infer what's going on here. So, for example, I know that tan theta is not going to be bounded by 1 and minus 1, so I can get rid of those. However, I know that tan of theta is sine theta over cosine theta. And whenever I divide by 0, when cosine theta equals 0, then tan of theta is undefined. We can't have something where we're dividing by a 0. So where is cosine theta 0? Well, it's at 90, or pi over 2, and at 270, or 3 pi over 2. So I know there's going to be vertical asymptotes at 90 degrees and 3 pi over 2, because I can't divide by a 0. The function isn't defined there. Now let's see what we can infer from the graph. Well, looking back up here, the gradient when theta 0 is 0, so we know it's 0, and then as it increases to 90, it's getting bigger, 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 and it's heading to infinity, just before it gets to pi over 2. So I know my graph is initially between 0 and 90 going to look like this, off to infinity that way. And then look what happens. At 90, tan graph, the gradient is undefined, but as soon as I flip over, look, this is a negative gradient. It's massively negative. So the gradient is a really negative number. So that means it's going to be coming from negative infinity down there. And then look, between that really massive negative number, as I open up theta up to pi, it's getting smaller, smaller, smaller until it's zero. And then when theta is pi, or 180 degrees, it's zero, and then it becomes positive, more positive, more positive, getting bigger, 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 whoa, 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 almost infinity just before 270 degrees, or 3 pi over 2. So, that's a 3 pi over 2. So, we can infer that it's going to be growing, 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 going through pi at 0, and then keep going, keep going, keep going, up to infinity like so. And then similarly, if we go just beyond 270 or 3 pi over 2, this is a massively negative gradient. Sorry, it's sloping downwards. So it's essentially, it's like near minus infinity, and then it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it gets to 0 at 360 degrees or 2 pi. So from 270 to 360, it's going from negative infinity and growing bigger, 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 bigger. And it goes through 0 at 2 pi radians or 360. Now, the temptation would be to say, well, this has a period, I can't spell period, 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 of 2 pi radians. But think about it. If this were to carry on, so it would go up to infinity like that, and then asymptote, and then we like that, and then asymptote, and then behind here, and then asymptote, and so on. If you think about it, it's actually just this part repeated over and over and over again. So actually the period is a lot shorter. And the period, well, from 90 to 270 is 180 degrees, or just pi. So we actually say the period of this graph is just pi. Um, it just repeats itself every pi radians. Okay. Now, let's have a look at some reciprocal trick stuff. So, let's grab this. And 
put it over here. Okay, now let's suppose if I've got y equals sine x, let's plot on top of this y equals cosec of theta. Sorry, I shouldn't have said sine x, it's sine theta. Okay, where s is 1 over sine. So now let's think about it. What would happen if I took all of these values and did 1 over them? Well, I know that 1 over 0 is going to be undefined, so I know it's going to have an asymptote here, because that's a 0. This is a 0, so there's going to be a vertical asymptote here. This is a 0, so there's going to be a vertical asymptote here. So in actual fact, it's going to, you know, it's going to be bounded off in these 180 degree or uh, period pi things. So you might think, hmm, maybe the period's 2 pi. But in actual fact, we need to be a bit more careful than that, because look what's going to happen. If I do the, the extreme, 1, do you get that 1 divided by 1 is 1? So they share that point in common. Now look what happens. As sine theta gets lower and lower to 0, you're dividing by a smaller number, so it's going to flip up like this. And then similarly, on the other side, it's going to flip up and go to infinity like so. And then similar arguments going to be down here. And then this one would be up like that. So actually, no, it repeats itself every 360 degrees, just like sine theta does. Um, I don't know, maybe a bit inappropriate, but I call them like the kissing cousins. Um, because you just take the bulge and you kind of flip it over, but you, you make um, this asymptotic. So clearly, for cosec theta... Uh, theta cannot equal uh, a multiple of pi, where n belongs to the set of integers. Right? Any integer multiple of pi radians, this isn't going to work. Okay. Well, you can probably see what's going to happen with cosine theta, actually. Because it's, it's the same shape as sine theta, it's just moved over a little bit. And I've given the game away here. So... What about if I do y equals secant of theta? Well, similar reason. This is a 0, so there's going to be a vertical asymptote here. Uh, this is a 0, so there's going to be a vertical asymptote here. There'll be a 0 here at 540 degrees, or 5 pi over 2. And for similar reasons, the, the 1s are going to stay the same, because 1 divided by 1 is the same. And then you can have like a kissing cousin effect like that, where they're almost like parabolas, but they skew off uh, to positive and negative infinity, respectively. So secant theta uh, has also has a period of 2 pi. Uh, but for secant theta, theta cannot equal. Now let's look at it. It has to be an odd multiple of pi over 2. So it's 1 pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2 or 5 pi over 2, and the way we'll write that is 2n plus 1 pi over 2. Theta cannot equal for that, and this is where n belongs to the set of integers. So clearly any integer, look, look what's happening. If I, if I take an integer n and double it, that's even, and then when I add 1 to it, I forced it to be odd. And then it's just that odd number times pi over 2. So... Yeah, it's just a way of saying any odd multiple of pi over 2. Okay, what about the last one? Well, we've done sec, cosec, and now we've just got cot or cotangent. Now, the cotangent one we've got to be a little bit careful of because there's other things at play, and you'll see what I mean in a second. So let's just make a nice big... Okay, now cotangent, it isn't just a case of going, okay, well, this is a zero, so there's going to be an asymptote there, and so on and so on. We're going to have to be a little bit um, little bit more careful. I mean, it may be the case, it may not be. The problem is tan is, is made up of sine and cosine. So y equals cotangent of theta... Essentially, what we've got here is actually cosine theta over sine theta. And now we can't divide by a zero. So where was sine theta equal to zero? 
Well, it was clearly up here when it's multiples of pi. So in actual fact, yes. We're going to have reciprocal here. We're going to have an asymptote here, asymptote here, asymptote here, asymptote somewhere here, and so on. And now here's the problem. Um, what happens in between those asymptotes? So if I get rid of this. So really, it looks like it repeats itself in this band. Because that band is the same as this one, and so on and so on. So let's just have a look. Well, what's going to happen? I've got a really small number. So 1 over a really small positive number is going to be a really large positive number. And then as I divide by larger and larger numbers, it's going to come down, come down, come down, and approach 0. Now we don't actually know what that value is there because it's undefined. But if we look at it from the other side, it's being divided by a really large negative number. So it's going to 1 over a large negative number is going to be a really small number. And then as you divide by a smaller and smaller negative number, or a larger one, it depends how you look at it, it's approaching 0, this is also going to tend to negative infinity like so. And now, when you're, you're wanting limits, if the limit from the left-hand side, which is approaching to 0, is the same as the limit from the right-hand side approaching to 0, then you can say there's a continuity there. Okay, so in actual fact, you've got this um, stained glass effect thing where cot kind of comes in from the top like that and then goes like this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all the blue stuff. And similarly, cotangent cannot exist, so theta cannot be equal to n pi, where n belongs to the set of integers. Okay, so for the right-hand side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tidy this up and get rid of all the blue stuff. So hopefully this will make it a lot easier to see what's going on. I just did them side by side to show you where they came from. Uh, do, do, do. I can go... Just tidying this up. Yeah, this one's probably the one where it's going to need the most attention. And the period, what is the period of um, of cot? Well, it's clearly pi as well, isn't it? It's repeating every 180 degrees or just pi radians. So it's got a period of pi. Okay, so hopefully where those things came from shouldn't be too much of a surprise. I'm just going to put boxes around these, so let's have... This be the cosec theta box. This be the um, sec theta box. And this will be the cot theta box. Okay, there's still stuff I want to do, so no spoilers. Okay. Right. Now, solving trigonometric equations. Now, I've teased you long enough. Let's solve uh, cosine 2x equals to half. Okay, so cosine, so cosine of 2x equals to a half, where x is trapped between less than or equal to 2 pi, greater than 0. So first thing to note is when you're looking at questions like this, you look at the top bit and you realize the question's in radians. So what I'm immediately going to do is I'm going to press uh, Shift menu for setup and I'm going to change my angle to radians. And that's it. You can tell if it's in radians that there's a little R at the top of your calculator. Uh, sometimes you need it, sometimes you won't. But yeah. Okay. So cosine of 2x equals a half. Right. So, a couple of things going on here. First of all, what does y equal k 
cosine of x look like between 0 and 2 pi? Well, cosine of x, as we've described before, looks like that. So there's pi over 2, there's 3 pi over 2, and it's trapped between 1 and minus 1 in the y-axis. But if I consider y equals cosine of 2x, well, that's a transformation inside the bracket, so it's an x-directional change, not as expected. So it's going to happen, it's going to get shrunk by a factor of 2, so it's going to happen once between 0 and pi, and then again between pi and 2 pi, like this. So that's 2 pi, there's pi, this was pi over 2, but that's now pi over 4, this was 3 pi over 2, so that's now going to be 3 pi over 4, this would have been 5 pi over 2, but that's 5 pi over 4, and this is going to be 7 pi over 4. Um, now, there's lots of ways of solving this. Personally, um, textbooks use this idea of a cast diagram, where in this quadrant, cosine is always positive, uh, all of them positive over here, sine's positive and tan's positive. Uh, I could do that. The problem is there's a few trig questions that the cast diagram just doesn't stand up to. Um, I like to use the analogy that the cast diagram is kind of like learning how to drive a car using an automatic. Uh, it's fun, it's easy, uh, but it's not very technical. And when you want to do more uh, technical things and you know things that require a little bit more finesse, the, the cast diagram kind of lets you down a little bit. Um, and I'm sure I'll, I'll find well, I'm sure I'll find a way of showing... Well, I know there was a question on the Advanced Extension Board paper in 2015, I think. It was a trig question, and yeah, the cast diagram is really good for when you've got a trig function equaling a constant. But when you've got a trig function equaling a trig function, you're a bit stuck. Um, I.e., if I had something like sine of x plus 30 equals to, let's say cosine of 2x minus 50. Say I had something like that going on, then the cast diagram wouldn't be particularly good here. Um, you could probably say, oh, well, you can just expand these out and do stuff to it, but yeah, that's that's just really, that's the slow way, and to be honest, you're not making it any simpler. You're expanding it and making eight terms, and yeah, it's not great. We're going to cover expanding stuff like that in the next time, but for the moment, I just want to be able to solve stuff like this. Okay. Next thing I want to consider is when cosine 2x equals a half. Well, I just consider if cosine of 2x is trapped between 1 and minus 1, a half is about here. So if I was to draw the line, y equals a half like this, I am looking to find 1, 2, 3, 4 solutions. in that interval. There clearly are four solutions at interval. And I think when you solve things graphically um, or just algebraically that I'm going to show you in a second, um, then that's going to make sense. So, okay. Now, to do this algebraically, I've, I've shown you how many solutions there are going to be with graphs. And yeah, you can carry on with the graph method and you could probably do the inverse cosine of a half and then halve it and then you'll get this value here and then you can work out by symmetry that this distance is the same as this distance back and then because the original cosine has a period of 2 pi the shrunk one is going to have a period of pi so you can just add pi to both of these and you'll get the next two uh, and so on and so on some people like that, some people find it confusing what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it purely algebraically um, and this, this is the, the crib sheet. So, sine of x is the same as sine of 180 degrees, or pi minus x. Okay, that's tip bit one. Why is that true? Well, I look up in my graph over here. Let's say I've got this value here. Let's say that's theta. If I go up... I take a horizontal line across, then if I go back theta from 180, that's also going to give me the same height. So here, clearly theta 
is going to be the same as 180 minus theta when I apply sine to both of these things. So that's clearly true. Okay, You can just figure it out by looking at the graph. And you can do a similar trick for cosine and tan. Cosine of x is going to be, now this time, it's cosine of 360 degrees minus x, or just cosine of 2 pi minus x. And for similar reasons, if I go to the cosine graph, if I go theta onwards from this side, and I draw horizontal, that's clearly theta back from 360, and it's going to have the same height. Okay, that shouldn't be a surprise either. And now tan, well, there's various things with tan, but the easiest one is tan of x is just going to be x plus whoops, 180 degrees, or just tan of x plus pi. Uh, tan's a bit boring, because it doesn't have a trick like that. You know, whatever theta is over here, you can just draw horizontal, and it's just theta on from 180, and so on. Now, so, you know how if I had x squared, um, okay, so how, how, how would you solve stuff? Well, okay, let's, let's, let's think about quadratics for a second. Suppose I had x minus 3 all squared equals to 4, right, and I wanted to solve for that. Well, the first thing you'd be doing is you'd be taking the square root, right, you'd be undoing the squared function. And by doing that, you'll get x minus 3 equals, and then the square root 4 is 2, but by undoing that square root function, you've introduced branches of solutions. So here, you would have to consider x minus 3 equals positive 2, and x minus 3 equals negative 2, which would give that x equals to 5, or x equals to 1. Both of those solutions would be valid. It's a similar approach when you're undoing signs or when you're undoing trig functions. Okay? When you undo a sine function, you're, you're going to split it between x's and 180's minus x's. When you're undoing a cosine, you're going to split it between x's and 360 minus x's, or 2 pi minus x's. I should have said pi minus x. And then similarly with tan of x, it's just it's going to be split between x's and x plus 180's or x plus pi's. You, you know, if you're, if you're undoing both sides, like so, you're going to get two principal branches splitting out. Okay, and the reason for that is because both of those things are going to have the same y values, aren't they? They're going to have the same y's. So, okay, let's talk about what I mean by that. So algebraically, using the cosine, what would that look like? Well, let's say I've got cosine of 2x... equals one half. Okay. I would also have to consider I would also have to consider that cosine of and I think about it, if cosine of something is going to be the same as cosine of 360 minus x or cosine of 2 pi minus x. So that is the same as 2 pi minus 2x equals to a half. Okay, when I inverse cosine, I have to consider there's two potential things. So, when I inverse cosine both sides, I'll get 2x equals the inverse cosine of a half, and I'll get 2 pi minus 2x equals the inverse cosine of a half. And now, here's the next bit. Because the periods... Because the periods, and this is really important, because the periods of each of these things are 2 pi, 2 pi, and pi, then clearly I should be able to add a multiple of 2 pi to this and get a similar answer, or I should be able to add a multiple of 2 pi to this one and get a similar answer, because it will keep repeating itself. And it's important you add it at this stage. Now look what's going to happen. If I inverse cosine of one half to both sides, I get a third of pi, 
So the next line of writing will be 2x equals a third of pi plus 2n lots of pi. And on the right hand side it will be 2 pi minus 2x equals a third of pi plus integer multiples of 2 pi. Okay, now we have to do is make x the subject for both of these. This is going to be really easy. The left hand side I divide by 2, so x equals pi over 3 divided by 2 is pi over 6, plus and 2n pi divided by 2 is just n lots of pi. So that is one branch of solutions. It's pi over 6 plus as many multiples of pi as I like. So x could be pi over 6, or plus another whole pi, which is going to be 7 pi over 6, plus another whole pi, which is going to be 13 pi over 6, oops, sorry, not a plus, or another whole pi, which is another 6 over 6 pi, so it's going to be 19 pi over 6, and you could carry this on. You could even carry it on to the negative direction, so pi 6 minus a pi is going to be minus 5 pi 6, uh, and so on and so on. Now, if I look at the original thing, it said between 0 and 2 pi. Now, remember, 2 pi is 12 pi over 6. So the only solutions that are between 0 and 12 pi over 6 are these two. So the rest can go away. They exist, but they're not particular solutions of our problem. So x is pi over 6 or 7 pi over 6 for that strand of solutions. Now that's good because we wanted four solutions and one half of the branch of solutions has given us two. So really the second lot should give us two as well. Okay, not difficult to see, I hope, that if I divide everything by two, I'll get pi minus x equals pi over six plus n pi. Uh, I could times everything by minus one, so this becomes x minus pi equals minus pi six uh, minus n pi, but n is just a, an integer, so I don't need to worry about that. I can make that positive. I mean, you can leave it minus if you want to. It doesn't matter. And then if I if I add pi to both sides, then yeah, then n is just some arbitrary integer of pi. So that's not going to change it. N is just, I don't know. Call it a new n. Call it capital n. Doesn't matter. The point is you're adding or subtracting some multiples of pi here, so it doesn't matter. So x is going to be minus pi 6 plus some integers of pi. So let's start off. So minus pi 6, if we add a whole pi, so it's 6 pi 6, it's going to be 5 pi 6. If we add another 6 out of 6 pi, then that's 11 pi 6. If we add another 6, it's going to be 17 pi of 6, and so on and so on. And if you remember, our theta value had to be between, our x value had to be between 0 and 2 pi, and that's 12 pi over 6, so clearly can't be the negative one, because it's less than 0, and 17 pi over 6 is bigger than 12 pi over 6, so it can't be those two. So the two solutions must be here. Okay, so actually, can you see where those things correspond to on this graph? So where's pi 6? Pi 6 is this solution here. Can you see why? Because it's just under a quarter of pi. And then what's the next largest one? Which well, is 5 pi 6. So 5 pi 6 is here. 5 pi 6. Which, if you think about it, is 1 sixth of pi under a whole pi. If you think about it, this gap between 0 and there is also 1 sixth of pi. So I should be able to go 1 sixth of pi on from pi. So that should be 7 pi 6, and that was there. And then similarly, 2 pi is 12 pi 6. So I should go back a sixth of pi from the end there to get 11 pi 6. Whoops, 11 pi over 6. So actually, this all makes sense. They're all just 1 sixth of pi away from the maximum points. Um, you know, of the cosine function. And we do have four solutions. It agrees with the graph. It's totally fine. Um, let's do one more, say. Let's say, um, let's do one of each. Let's say I've got sine of, um, let's have 2x minus pi over 6 
equals um, let's have root 3 over 2 okay and let's let's say this is between x is between less than or equal to pi but greater than 0 so let's, let's have eg2 okay let's solve this one okay so first of all let's consider what the sine graph looks like well the sine graph really easy sketch is going to look like this now we've got two transformations in the brackets now, it doesn't particularly matter about the transformations uh, because we're just going to apply this thing again so I don't even need to draw a sketch but I'm just going to try and convince you of how many solutions there are so inside the brackets is x, x directional change bod mass not as expected so you're going to move right pi over 6 so all of this moves right to pi over 6 so this point here is going to be pi over 6 but then timesing by 2 is going to shrink it by a factor of 2 so actually this whole thing is going to oops this whole thing is going to mate come on no okay what's going on here so this it's normally like that, but it's going to shrink by a factor of 2 in the x direction, so it actually gets twice as small and closer to the x axis. It's going to look like that. So really, instead of pi over 6, it's actually going to start at pi over 12. It's going to go down there like that. And if you think about it, the sine graph would have normally stopped at 2 pi, but then when we moved it pi to the 6 to the right, it becomes plus pi over 6. And when you divide by 2, it becomes a pi, a pi plus a twelfth of pi, which is actually going to be 13 twelfths of pi. So a little bit of mental maths. This point here is 13 pi twelfths. Okay, which is nice because we want x to be between 0 and pi. And if we want it to equal root 3 over 2, well, if it's still bounded by 1 and minus 1, we haven't changed the y-directional point, root 3 over 2 is just under 1. So that's going to be a horizontal line like that. So actually, we're only looking for two solutions. So this is actually going to be quite nice and quick. Okay. So, um, let's boogity boogity. Right, okay. So what we're going to do, well we're going to have to solve either sine of 2x minus pi over 6 equals root 3 over 2, or consider when sine of... Now remember, sine of x is the same as sine of pi minus x. So that's the same as sine of pi minus brackets 2x minus pi over 6. And this could also equal to root 3 over 2. Okay, you might want to tidy this up first. So sine of pi minus and minus pi over 6 is going to be 7 pi over 6, and minus 2x becomes a minus 2x. Cool. Now I can inverse sine of both sides. So shift inverse sine of fraction root 3 over 2 is 1 third pi again. Shocker doodle doo. So this will become 2x minus pi over 6 equals uh, a third of pi. But this time, we have to remember that sine repeats itself every 2 pi radians. So remember, we have to add a multiple of 2 pi radians. Now, I usually put 2n pi. That's fine. And over here, we're going to have 7 pi over 6 minus 2x equals pi over... 3 plus an integer multiple of 2 pi radians. Okay, right, same deal. I'm going to divide both sides by 2. So this becomes x minus a pi twelfths equals to pi over 6 plus n pi. And if I add a twelfth over to there, then a sixth of pi is 2 twelfths. So 2 twelfths plus 1 twelfth is 3 twelfths. 3 twelfths, I believe, is a quarter of pi. So x is going to equal to a quarter of pi plus integer multiples of pi. 
And then similarly, uh, if I divide everything by 2 here, this becomes 7 pi over 12 minus x equals pi over 6 plus integer multiples of just pi. Now if I times everything by minus 1, that's going to be x minus 7 pi twelfths equals to minus pi sixths, just plus a different multiple of pi. It doesn't matter. It's just some multiple. It doesn't matter. And then minus a sixth of pi is minus two twelfths. So if I add seven twelfths, minus two plus seven is going to give five pi twelfths plus an integer multiple of pi, and this equals to x. Now clearly, if I add or subtract any multiples of x to either of these solutions, it's going to be outside the range of zero to pi, right? Because if I subtract pi, then pi over 4 minus pi is going to be negative 3 pi of quarters, which is clearly great, lower than 0. And if I subtract pi from 5 pi twelfths, and that's 12 pi twelfths taken away from 5 pi twelfths, which is minus 7 pi twelfths, that's negative, so it's going to work. And if I add pi, it's clearly going to be bigger than pi, isn't it? Because it's pi plus stuff. So actually the two solutions are this value, which is pi over 4, and this value, which is 5 pi over 12. Now, there's actually... Three more things. Well, okay, you're probably thinking, okay, uh, well, how do you solve um, how do you solve uh, cot, cosec, and sec? Well, that's easy because if I told you to solve sec of theta equals to two, just remember sec is one over cosine theta that equals to two. So if I reciprocate both sides, that means cosine theta equals to a half. So really, you can turn all these reciprocal things into sines, cosines, and tans at the end of the day. And you really only need to know um, this table in order to solve stuff. Uh, so if you want to solve an equation involving cot, then just remember it's 1 over tan, and remember to reciprocate things at the very end. Now, I need to show you the inverse graphs. Now, they're not the same as the inverse, uh, the reciprocals, sorry. So at the bottom here, have I got space? Yeah. I need to show you what y of inverse sine of x looks like. Now, this is another thing I didn't stress enough of. The inverse sine of x is not, not, not the same as 1 over sine of x. Okay? It's completely different, right? And it's the same with all the trig functions. The inverse is not the same as the reciprocal. Please get that right. Okay, one of them is undoing a trig. Okay, because essentially what a trig is doing is I've got an angle as an input, and then I apply my trig function, and it spits out a length ratio. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. That's a ratio of lengths. It's the opposite length over the hypotenuse length. Okay, the inverse trig does the reverse process. It takes a length ratio and it spits out an angle. Sorry, I've completely monged that up. The inverse trig is reversing this process. It takes a length ratio and spits out an angle. That's the inverse trig. The reciprocal trig is the, the same, you know, as a normal trig. It's just the only difference is, is you've got a 1 over trig function going on here. It takes an angle and spits out a length ratio. They're two completely different things. Don't get them confused. So y equals inverse sine of x. Well, let's think about this. Now previously, well, why did we pick x? Let's pick theta. Now, before... When I looked at sine theta, it was the y value that was trapped between 1 and minus 1. So when I inverse this, that means now the x value is going to be trapped between 1 and minus 1. Okay. So, actually got a couple of things going on here. The graph of the inverse sine function looks like this. It's going to curve up like that. Whoops, that's terrible. where that point there is pi over 2 on the y-axis, and it's going to curve down here like that, where that point there is minus pi over 2. 
and these are like vertical asymptotes. Okay, why does it look like this? Well, because when you inverse something, you're literally going forwards to backwards, backwards to forwards. You're reflecting about y equals x. You're swapping the x's and y's over. So if I was to draw a diagonal line like so, y equals x, then you should have something like this going on where it's reflected about that. And you can see that that would create that periodic function that we've seen before. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, so if it does go on forever, why doesn't this sine function just keep swirling up like that forever and ever and down there like that? Well, it's got something to do with something called functions. Okay, a function, without getting too heavy into it, a function, a function must have one output. Okay, it can, it can be a many to one function, i.e. it's got many inputs and one output, or it can be a one to one function, i.e. for every one input there's one output. Now, here's the deal. Functions, they must have one output. So think about it. If you've got a many to one function, if you used to invert it, then it would be one input to many outputs. So that's not an invertible function. If you think about it, that's exactly what sine is. If you look at sine, there's many values. There could be that one, that one, that one, that one, for example, that all have the same output, i.e. the same y value. Right? Sine is a many to one function. It's got many inputs, many x's to one output, y's. There is many x's to one y's. So it's not invertible as we leave it as it is. So what we do is we restrict it so it becomes a one to one. Because if you reflect one to one, it's a one to one that way, and then it becomes a one to one going backwards, everything's okay. We're going to cover this more in functions, but essentially what you need to know is that the inverse sine graph lives in this little box that's between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 and 1 and minus 1 in the x-axis. For cosine, it's a similar story. So for y equals inverse cosine of x, it's going to be trapped between 1 and minus 1. But now let's think about it a little bit more. It started at 1. When I inverse cosine 1, I will get a 0. It's going to go something like that. Where it's going to cross here at pi over 2. And at this point on the y-axis, which is pi, it's going to be minus 1. So actually it looks like this. And then finally, what does the inverse tan function look like? Well, this one's quite interesting because the the y-axis was it could be anything, it could be positive to negative infinity. So that means the x-axis now is going to be between positive and negative infinity. But this time what we're going to do is we're just going to take what's called the principal branch. And the principal branch that we're interested in is going to be about 0 and minus 90 to 90. So between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, there's going to be horizontal asymptotes like this. And then from 0, it's going to look like that. It's never going to reach pi over 2. And then this never reaches negative pi over 2 that way. And it goes on to infinity. OK. Now, the f I've, no, I've yammered on so much. I'm really sorry. But the last thing, I promise is the last thing, is that instead of saying inverse 
sine of x, and instead of saying inverse cosine and inverse tan of x, you may see in questions this written as arc sine of x, arc cos of x, and arc tan of x. This arc just means inverse. So, for example, you might see the arc cot, the arc sec, and the arc cosec function, although I doubt it very much. But the point is, if it's got arc in front of it, then it means the inverse. Okay, so technically I've drawn the arc sine theta function, the arc cos theta function, and the arc tan theta function. Okay, and I leave it to you to kind of write a similar thing up here for where those values of theta or x are valid for. Okay, so I'm just going to end the video with lots of examples. If you want to pause it and go through them yourself, I'm going to go through lots of them. So pause the video, give it a go yourself. Okay, first thing to notice is that the question says solve for x is between 0 and 180 degrees. So first of all, it's in degrees, so you need to change your calculator to the degree setting, which I've just done. So, let's have a look at sine of x plus 10 degrees equals root 3 over 2. So, that means, now I could draw a diagram, but to be honest, it's just quicker this way. Either sine of x plus 10 degrees equals root 3 over 2, or this can split up into the other principal branch, which is sine of 180 degrees minus x plus 10 degrees uh, equals root 3 over 2. Which means if I inverse sine of both sides, then x plus 10 degrees equals the inverse sine of root 3 over 2, I believe is 60 degrees, plus integer multiples of 360 degrees, full turns. And 180 minus 10 is going to be 170 degrees minus x equals inverse sine of root 3 over 2 is 60 degrees plus integer multiples of 360. Um, if I minus 10 from both sides, I'll get x equals 50 degrees plus n lots of 360 over here. And if I times by minus 1, I'll get x minus 170 equals to minus 60 plus just a different integer of 360 degrees. If I add 170, I believe that's 110 degrees plus multiples of 360 degrees equals x. And clearly, the only ones that are between 0 and 180 is going to be 50 from here and 110 from here. So they're the only two solutions. Okay, part b, solve cosine of 2x equals minus 0.9. Okay, let's do this in a different colour. So, same deal. I'm going to have cosine of 2x equals minus 0.9. Minus 0.9 is between 1 and minus 1, so I know this has solutions. And this is going to be the same as cosine of 360 degrees minus 2x equals negative 0.9. I want to give my answers to one decimal place, so I'm probably going to do it to three decimal places and around at the end. So inverse cosine of negative 0.9 is 154.158. So I've actually got from this principal branch 2x equals 154.158. And this means this is 154.158. This is going to be 360 degrees. This is a degrees minus 2x times by minus 1. So I've got 2x minus 360 degrees equals 154 negative 0.158. If I divide by 2 both sides, I get x equals, divide this by 2, I get 77.079. So to one decimal place, that's 77.1 degrees. And over here, uh, if I divide this by 2, I'll get x minus 180 degrees equals minus, and then this was 77.079. Uh, so... If I add 180 to that, I should get x, because it's going to equal to 102.92, which is 102.9 degrees, to one decimal place. Cool. So yeah, I mean, when you get used to it, it's actually 
only three or four lines of working, uh, you know, having a good solid um, understanding of what the graphs are helps tremendously with this. Um, and with practice, you know that, you know, 180 minus for the sine, 360 minus for that. If you want to use the cast diagram, that's completely up to you, but I don't know, it just seems a bit silly. Okay, pause the video, give it a go yourself. Cool. Okay, so given that sine theta equals 5 cos theta, find the value of tan theta. Well, I know that sine divided by cosine is tan, so if I divide both sides by cosine theta, I'll actually get tan theta equals to 5. So that wasn't actually that bad. Hence or otherwise, find the values of theta in the interval between 0 and 360, for which sine theta equals 5 cos theta, giving your answer to one decimal place. Well, really, I just have to inverse tan uh, 5, and that equals to theta, and I can just add as many multiples of 180 degrees to that as I like. So inverse tan of 5 is 78.7 to one decimal place, which is integer multiples of 180. Uh, and I've got to find it between that and 360. So my two answers are going to be 78.7. Whoops, not plus. And if I add 180 once to that, I will get 258. If I add another 180 to that, it'll be 438, which is outside the bounds. So theta has to be those two values. So yeah, pretty quick question when you know how to do it. Um, anyway, let's crack on. Okay, pause the video. Okay, so first thing, it's going to want me to sketch a graph, and I notice that it's in radians. So I'm guessing with the later part, I'm going to have to solve this. So I'm going to change my calculator to radians right now, save myself the problem. So angle, radians, done. OK, so sketch the graph, y equals sine of x plus pi over 6 between 0 and 2 pi. OK, so first of all, the sine of x graph looks like this between 0 and 2 pi, where it's bounded between 1 and minus 1. This point here is pi, and that's 2 pi x plus pi over 6 means everything is going to be shifted whoops everything is going to be shifted back a sixth of pi like that so in actual fact your graph should look like this okay and if this were to continue it would intercept the x axis at minus pi over 6 Remember, inside the brackets, x direction not as expected. So it's just the sine graph, but shifted left pi over 6. Part B, write down the exact coordinates of the points where the graph meets the coordinate axis. OK, well, since everything's back pi over 6, then a sixth of pi taken away from pi, this is going to be 5 pi sixths. And 2 pi, which is 12 pi minus a sixth pi, sorry, 12 pi sixths minus 1 pi sixths, it's going to be 11 pi over 6. And then this point here is when x is 0. Well, what's sine of pi over 6? That's sine of 30. So this is actually going to be a half on the y-axis. Um, part C, solve for that equation equals to this. OK, not a problem. So either sine of x plus pi over 6 equals to 0 0.65, which is OK, or this splits up into sine of pi minus the x, which is x plus pi over 6 in this case, and this equals 0 0.65. So uh, if I inverse sine of both sides of 0 0.65, um, da, 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 there's two decimal places, that's 0 0.71. I'll well, do it to 4, just to, but then I'll round, so 0 0.706. And this equals to x plus pi over 6. And then this is going to equal 0 0.7076 and stuff. And pi minus pi 6 is going to be 5 pi 6. And this will be minus x. 
and I can also add as many integer multiples of 2n pi to both sides. Totally fine. Uh, if I minus a sixth of pi from that, so minus fraction uh, pi over 6, then the left hand will be uh, to one, two decimal places, 0.18 rads or radians. And on the right hand side, if I times by minus 1, I'll get x minus 5 pi 6 equals to negative 0 0.706 plus 2 lot, that's an n, uh, a different multiple of 2 pi. Uh, so, negative inverse sine of uh, 0 0.65. Okay, and then I need to add that fraction, which is 5 shift pi over 6. So apparently this answer is going to be 1.91 rads. And clearly if I add 2n pi or subtract 2n pi, I'm going to be outside of this bound. Uh, if I wanted to find all the solutions between 0 and 4 pi, say, then I'd have to add another pi to each of these solutions and there would be 4 solutions, not 2. Okay. Right, pause the video, give it a go. Okay, this one's tricky. What it's doing is it's getting up quadratics in disguise. So show that that equation can be written as that. So the trick here is to know that sine squared x plus cos squared x equals to 1. So that means sine squared x can be written as 1 minus cosine squared. So I'm going to write this thing out as 4 lots of 1 minus cosine squared x plus 9 cosine x minus 6 equals to 0. Now why did I do that? Because I realized that this thing that I'm trying to work towards has no sines in it. So I need to turn that sine squared into a cos squared like so. If I expand the brackets, 4 times 1 is 4, plus or minus 6 uh, is going to be a minus 2. 4 times minus cos squared is minus 4 cosine squared x. And then I've got a plus 9 cosine x equals to 0 times everything by minus 1 to get 4 cosine squared x minus 9 cosine x plus a 2 equals to 0. And now I've got the desired form. Okay, hence solve for x is between 0 and 720. This is in degrees, so I'm going to change my calculator again. Yeah, get used to that. Happens a lot. Okay, uh, now it's between 0 and 720. So, okay, so solve that to one decimal place. So we've got to do a bit of stuff to this first. So imagine, let cosine of x equal to a. Then this is a quadratic where 4a squared minus 9a plus 2 equals to 0. Uh, I make that 4a minus 1 times a minus 2. Yeah, I think that's factorized properly. So either a is going to equal to a quarter or a will equal to 2, that means cosine of x will equal to a quarter, or cosine of x will equal to 2. This has no solutions, because the cosine graph looks like this, and 2 is just a horizontal line up there, so they don't intercept, whereas cosine of quarter is going to be something like that. It's going to cross twice between 0 and 360, so actually there's four solutions to this, because there's two between... 0 and 360, so if this repeats again, yeah. Okay, so we've got to solve cosine of x equals a quarter. Okay, so let's solve that. So cosine of x equals a quarter, or branch solution, cosine of 360 degrees minus x equals a quarter. I want to one decimal place, so I'll inverse cosine this. Inverse cosine of a quarter is going to be, let's call it 75.52, so this is 75.52, and inverse cosine that side is going to be 360 degrees minus x, that's a degrees, that's a degrees, and this is x. So I'm actually going to get x is 75 plus 52 plus integer multiples of not 2 pi, you silly boy, uh, integer multiples of 360 degrees, or it's that plus integer multiples of 360. Um, 
So from this one, I'll get one solution is 75.5, and another solution is if I add 360 to that, which will get 435.5 degrees. So there's actually two solutions there. Here, if I make X the subject, this will be uh, minus 360, add it onto there. So it'll be 360 minus that. So 360 minus your answer. So I make that 284.5 degrees plus integer multiples of 360. So if I add 360 to that, so that means I'm going to have 284.5 degrees, and the next one up is 644.5 degrees, and those are the two solutions from that side. So what this corresponds to on the graph is this 75.5 is probably this solution, and this 284.5 is going to correspond to that one. And if I was to continue this graph going on like this, then then you're going to have the other red solution over here corresponds to this, and this solution is going to correspond to that one. Okay. Right, getting on to the juicy stuff. Um, pause the video, give it a go yourself. Okay, so using sine squared plus cos squared equals to 1, or identity equals to 1, show that cosec squared minus cot squared equals to 1. Well, if you divide by sine squared, that divided by sine squared, that divided by sine squared, and that divided by sine squared. Sine squared over sine squared is 1, cos squared over sine squared is cot squared, and 1 over sine squared is cosec squared of theta. All you have to do is minus cot squared from both sides. And you get cosec squared minus cot squared equals to 1. Hence or otherwise prove this is the case. Well, look, this is a difference of squares. It's very tricky because think about it. Cot squared of theta squared is just cot to the 4 of theta. Squared squared is just squared. So this bracket is just going to be cot squared theta plus cosec squared theta times by cot squared theta. Oh, geez, wrong way around. It's the cosec one first. It's going to be cosec squared theta plus cot squared, and then this will be cosec squared theta minus cot squared theta. And you've just proven in the previous example that cosec squared minus cot squared equals to 1, so this bracket is just 1, and you're left with cosec squared theta plus cot squared, which is this. Finally, hence solve for that. Well, I now know what this is. This is just going to be uh, cosec squared theta plus uh, cot squared theta, and this will equal to 2 minus cot of theta. Um, right. Well... What is cosec squared? Well, cosec squared is 1 plus cot squared. So actually, if this is 1 plus cot squared theta, then the left-hand side becomes 1 plus 2 cot squared theta, and the right-hand side is 2 minus cot of theta. And if you do some stuff to it, this becomes 2 cot squared theta plus cot of theta. And then if you minus 2, that becomes a minus 1, and you've got this. Uh, if you let cot of theta equal to a, for example, then you're going to have 2a squared plus a minus 1 equals to 0. This is just another quadratic in disguise, isn't it? So this is does this factorise? Uh, I want to say that's a 1, that's a 1, that's a minus, that's a plus. Uh, it looks like it is to me. So you're either going to have a equals a half, so cot of theta equals a half, or you're going to have cot theta, or a is going to be minus 1, so cot theta equals to minus 1. Now, to deal with this, cot is 1 over tan. So if I flip both sides, that means I now have to solve tan theta equals to 2, and tan theta equals to minus 1 over 1, which is still minus 1. Okay, this one's probably the easiest to solve, because if I inverse tan of minus 1, this is just going to be negative 45 degrees, and I can just keep adding 180 to that, so the next one will be 135 degrees, and so on and so on. 
And in actual fact, there's only going to be one solution between 90 and 180, and that's going to be 135. However, inverse tan of 2, if I inverse tan of 2, I will get 63.43. So if tan of theta equals to 2, then theta equals the inverse tan of 2, which is 63.4 to one decimal place. Is it 1 to 1? No, it doesn't say. Plus integer multiples of 180 degrees. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I can't add 180 degrees to 63.4 and it's in that region. So it looks like there's only one solution. Interesting, 135. Yeah, seems legit. So this isn't actually going to give any solutions. How weird. Fair enough. Pause the video, give it a go yourself. I've, I've done quite a lot of uh, examples for this just because I want to hammer home a few points. Maybe you find it useful, maybe you don't. Okay, so given that sine squared plus cos squared is equivalent to 1, show that 1 plus tan squared is sec squared. Well, that's easy. I'm just going to divide everything by cos squared because I know that sine over cos is tan. So sine squared over cos squared is going to give a tan squared. Cos squared over cos squared is 1. And 1 over cos squared is just sec squared. So yeah, that was easy. Just divide by cos squared. Solve for this. Well, 2 tan squared. Well, think about it. If I make tan squared the subject, then tan squared theta equals sec squared theta minus 1. So 2 tan squared is 2 lots of sex theta squared minus 1. So this thing can be replaced with two lots of sex squared theta minus 1 plus a sec of theta equals to 1. This is clearly going to be a quadratic in disguise with two sex squared theta minus 2, but then minus this one makes a minus 3 plus a sec of theta. Uh, and same deal, if sec theta, let's just say, is u, then I've got 2u squared plus u minus 3 equals 0. Uh, does this factorize? Uh, if I let this be... Ooh. Does that work? I've got 3u there and a minus 2u. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, either u is going to equal minus 3 over 2, or u is going to equal to 1 which means sec of theta equals to minus 3 over 2, or sec of theta equals to 1, or cosine of theta, because it's 1 over cos, is minus 2 thirds, just flip it, or cosine theta equals to 1. Well, cosine theta equals to 1 is really easy from the graph. It's just where theta is 0, or any multiple of 360 degrees. And it, well, yeah. So I can't have 360 because of this but I can have zero, so it's just one solution there. However, over here, cosine minus two-thirds. Now notice how um, not being able to draw the graph doesn't matter if I know that cosine of theta equals minus two-thirds is one principal branch, and the other principal branch is cosine of uh, 360 degrees minus theta equals minus two-thirds. And if I want this to one decimal place, this will be inverse cosine of minus two thirds. So that means theta equals 131.8 degrees plus integer multiples of 360, or 360 degrees minus theta equals 131.8 degrees plus integer multiples of 360. Um, fine. So because it's between 0 and 360, I can't add any more here. So 131.8 is the only solution from that branch. And over here, if I do this, then theta is going to be 
0.2 degrees plus different integer multiples of 360. And again, I can't add any more to that because that will clearly be outside of 0 to 360. So I've got three solutions there, 0, 131.8, and 228.2 degrees. Cool. Right, is this the last one? Yes, it is. All right, something really to throw you up. Um, pause the video, give it a go, see if you can find. You are paying attention, you'll get it. If not, don't beat yourself up. Okay, so simplify showing all steps in the calculation, the expression of arctan 8 plus arctan 2 plus arctan of 2 thirds. Now, there's various ways of evaluating uh, the addition of arctan. One of them is using tan of A plus B. And we've talked about that before, but I don't want to get that into that too much because I didn't cover it today. What I really wanted you to get a hold of was this really subtle point that I made. Trig functions take angles and output length ratios. So inverse trig functions take length ratios and spit out angles. So what I want you to consider is actually this is an angle, let's call it theta 1. This is an angle, this is theta 2. And this is an angle, theta 3. And all we're trying to do is find out what happens when we add those three angles. So, what I want you to consider is the following. If I've got tan of theta 1, that's the opposite over adjacent, right? Because toa. So that means theta 1 is arctan, inverse tan, of the opposite over adjacent. So if the arctan is 8, that just means the ratio of the opposite to adjacent is 8 over 1. So I could draw a triangle like that, where this is, oops, where this is 90, this is theta over 1, and the opposite is 8 and the adjacent is 1. So actually that's really dumb, that's nowhere near to scale. So maybe something like this. There you go. Where this is 8, this is 1. And that's theta 1. And if you're interested, the hypotenuse is going to be the square root of 8 squared plus 1 squared, which is root 65. Okay. What about arctan 2? Well, the opposite is 2, the adjacent is 1. So this is going to be height of one, height of 2, adjacent 1. It's going to be a much smaller triangle. Well, it, it could be scaled up, right? I mean, for every two of these, there's one there. That's theta 2. And then 1 squared plus 2 squared is root 5. Okay, an arctan of two-thirds, well, that just means, well oh dear, that just means for every, oh dear, that's better, for every opposite of two adjacent three, if this is theta three, that's arctan of two thirds, and the hypotenuse is going to be three squared plus two squared, which is nine plus four, which is root 13. Now, I've got a really, really, really sneaky suspicion because all of these hypotenuses are multiples of each other. For example, root 65 is just root five times by root 13. So I reckon these triangles can be put together in some way. Okay, so what am I going to do? Right, this is going to take a lot of imagination. You're probably going to be thinking, like, what on earth are you on about? Okay, what am I going to do? Well, first of all, let's take this triangle. Okay, let's, let's, let's flip it like that. So let's remember everything that's going on here. So this is theta 1, that's of length 1, this is 8, and this is root 65. Now, I'm going to take this triangle, and I'm going to flip it and put it over here. So it now looks like this. And I know this is going to match up. Oh dear. That's terrible. 
Come on. Mate, what's going on? Right, okay. So, this is my 90. They both share this length 1. This must be 2. So this hypotenuse must be root 5. And this angle here is theta 2. Right, now, here's the magic. I am going to take this triangle and I'm going to try and shove it and flip it down here. But notice how if I times all of these things by root 5, it will now have a hypotenuse of root 65 to match this one. So if I try and put theta 3 there, that, so that's 90, that's theta 3, uh, root 65, that's fine. The next to it is 3 root 5, and the opposite is 2 root 5. Now, hmm, what does this look like? Well, I might not have drawn this accurately, but what if it was one big fat right angle triangle? Well, what would that mean for theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3? Well, that would mean it's exactly pi because it's a straight line. It's 180 degrees. How could we check if this was actually... Um, yeah, how could we check if it actually was the case? Well, wouldn't it be... Wouldn't it be that we have this length squared plus this length squared equals the hypotenuse squared. Well look, I've got an 8 plus 2, so that's a 10 up there. I've got 3 root 5 and a root 5, which is 4 root 5. And over here I've got a 2 root 5. So does 4 root 5 squared plus 2 root 5 squared equal to 10 squared? Well, 10 squared is easy, that's 100. 4 root 5 is 16 times by root 5 squared, which is 5 plus 2 squared, which is 4, times by 5. 16 times 5 is 80. 4 times 5 is 20. Does 80 plus 20 equals 100? Yes. This must be a right-angled triangle, so in actual fact, this is a straight line. Now, there's another argument to be had here. Because we're arc-tanning things. How do you know we're not going to obtuse angles or whatever? Uh, rather reflex angles and this is actually some large thing and you would actually get different values for um, for this should you use the tan of a plus b things now I'm going to give a different argument suppose suppose right here's do you remember the arc tan function it looks like this where it's bounded between pi over 2 in the y-axis and negative pi over 2 down here. Now, here's the deal. Arctan of 8 is when I put 8 in here, I trace that up, and it gives me a value, and that is theta 1. Arctan of 2 is down here. Trace that up, that will give me a different value, theta 2. And then arctan two-thirds, well there's two-thirds, I trace it up and it will spit out theta three. Here's the deal. If it's a straight line, that means tan of all these three things combined equals some multiple of pi. Okay. Think about it. Tan, or rather... For tan of 180 is 0, isn't it? So these three angles must be some integer multiple of pi. They could be. They could potentially be an integer multiple of pi. All I know is they lie on a straight line, so tan of these, the sum of these three things equals to 0. So I have to consider all other possible combinations of theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 adding together to give a multiple of pi. Well, think about it. I've got three numbers which are lower than pi over 2, but greater than 0. So think about it. 
I've got theta 1, which is less than pi over 2 and 0. I've got theta 2, which is less than pi over 2, but greater than 0. And I've got theta 3, which is less than pi over 2 and greater than 0. If I add all these together, then I've got theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3 is greater than 0, but less than 3 pi over 2. Now, what's the only multiple of pi that's greater than 0, but less than 3 pi over 2? Well, it's clearly pi. There's various ways you could have proved this problem. It's a very difficult problem. It was on the special papers for Madas. Um, there's various ways you could have solved it. Uh, the way I did it was um, without using any tan of A plus B addition formulas, stuff like that. Anyway, guys, I have yammered on far too long. I hope you found this useful. Um, and yeah, have fun.